Greetings, statistics scholars, and welcome to a video on section 6.3 dealing with inference involving differences in population proportions. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at both the creation of confidence intervals and also hypothesis testing involving differences in population proportions. Let's begin with a question. Suppose that a new wildlife sanctuary has recently been proposed in Illinois, and we're interested in finding out uh, what the difference is between the levels of support of Illinois women and Illinois men for this new proposed sanctuary. So to investigate that, we take some samples. A sample of 80 Illinois women reveals that 30 of them support the sanctuary. A random sample of 100 men shows that 32 of them support the sanctuary. And so from that, we have some sample proportions. First, we would have what we might call P1 hat, which is the sample proportion of women who support the sanctuary. 30 divided by 80, or 0.375. Next, the sample proportion of men who support the sanctuary. 32 out of 100, or 0.32. Those are our initial statistics. And we'd like to create a confidence interval, and let's say a 90% confidence interval for the difference in the unknown population proportions. For starters, we should use the difference in our sample proportions as a statistic that will help us estimate the difference in the unknown population proportions. That is, we should take a look at uh, the difference between P1 hat and P2 hat. What would that be? Well, since P1 hat was found to be 0 0.375, 37.5%, and P2 hat was found to be 0.32, 32%, the difference in those uh, sample proportions was 0 0.055 or 5.5%. 5 .5%. That number, that difference in sample proportions should be the statistic that we put in the center of our confidence interval. But what type of distribution should we use when creating this interval? Well we can find that the, dis the distribution of differences in sample proportions will be normally distributed. That can be verified because four inequalities can be checked to see that they're true. We check N1 times P1 hat, the sample size from the first sample times the first sample proportion, and we find that it's 30, which is greater than or equal to 10. Then we multiply the first sample size N1 times 1 minus P1 hat and find that it's 50. That's also greater than or equal to 10. Having both of those numbers over the threshold number of 10 is part of what we need. But we also must verify that those inequalities are true for the other sample as well. So we take N2 times P2 hat and find that that's 32. Taking in 2 times 1 minus P2 hat, we find that that's 68. Again, both of these numbers are at least 10. Since all four of these statements are true, since all four of those products, N1 times P1, N1 times 1 minus P1, N2 times P2, and N2 times 1 minus P2, since they all are at least 10, this verifies that the differences in the sample proportions will be normally distributed. Now a little note, you may note that the products there that we've come up with are nothing more than the numbers of individuals in each of the samples who said yes and no. For example, in the sample of women, there were 30 women who said yes, they approved, and 50 who said that they didn't out of the 80. So those products are simply nothing more than the number who say yes and the number who say no in each of the two samples. 
if all four of those numbers are at least 10, then we are justified in using a normal distribution. And so we will. Well, what do we know about the standard error for differences in sample proportions? The formula for standard error for differences in sample proportions looks a lot like the formula that we had from section 6.1 dealing with the standard error for a single sample proportion. You might remember in that scenario, we had a square root. And underneath the square root, we had p times 1 minus p divided by n. Well, here we're going to have something very similar. Only since we have two samples, we will have two fractions underneath our square root symbol. So p1 times 1 minus p1 divided by n1 plus p2 times 1 minus p2 divided by n2. And the sum of those two fractions will go underneath our square root symbol. Now, we don't actually know the values of p1 and p2. They're unknown population parameters. So we will use our best estimates, our p1 hat and our p2 hat in their stead. So the formula that we will use is that standard error for difference in proportions when we're making a confidence interval is the square root of the sum of two fractions. The first fraction, p1 hat times 1 minus p1 hat divided by n1. The second fraction, p2 hat times 1 minus p2 hat divided by n2. We compute those two fractions, add them together, and take the square root of the result. And this will give us our estimate for the standard error of the statistic. That standard error can then be used to help us determine the margin of error for the confidence interval. Since our differences in proportions are normally distributed, that means that we will use the familiar formula margin of error equals z star times standard error. z star is the critical z value that is chosen to give us the confidence level we desire. Now, earlier I mentioned a 90% level of confidence. So here in this case, we recall that 1.645 is the z star value that we use from the standard normal distribution to enable us to have 90% confidence in our results. Now, since our standard error is calculated by the formula from the previous slide, here's what we find the standard error to be in this particular case. We substitute in the value of P1 hat equal to 0.375, and p2 had equal to 0.32. And we substitute those values into our formula, compute out the fractions, add them together, take the square root. That calculator work shows that the standard error for this particular case is approximately 0 0.0715. That's our standard error. Multiplying that by the 1.645 z star value then gives us our margin of error. The margin of error is 1.645 times 0 0.0715. That means our margin of error turns out to be 0.118 in this case. That's the amount that we're going to add and subtract to our statistic to come up with the limits of our confidence interval. 0.118. As we said, we're going to add and subtract those values from our statistic. Remember from earlier that our statistic was the difference in the sample proportions. There were 5.5% more women in our sample, Illinois women, who approved of the sanctuary. That number goes right in the center of the interval. But now we take our margin of error and add and subtract it. When we subtract 0.118 from 0 0.055, we get negative 0 0.063 for our lower limit. When we add 0.118 to 0 0.055, we get 0 0.173 as our upper limit. 
And so now we certainly have our interval. We'll conclude by saying that we are 90% confident that for Illinois women and men, the difference in the proportions of those who approve of the new wildlife sanctuary is somewhere between negative 6.3% and positive 17.3%. Now, let's think about that for a moment. If we're saying that the likely values range anywhere from negative 6.3% to positive 17.3%, what does that really mean? Well, it means in analysis that because the number zero is inside of that interval as a possible value for the difference, that means in fact that we found that there may not be any difference at all in the attitudes of Illinois women and men. After all, one of the likely values is zero. And a difference of zero means that there is no difference uh, quite possibly between the attitudes of Illinois women and men. Even though we had a sample statistic that showed uh, a, a, an increase or a, a level of 5.5% higher for women, it turns out that because of the margin of error, it's still very possible that there may not be any difference at all. So to review, we have all the ingredients to form confidence intervals for differences in proportions. What did we do? First, we found the difference in the sample proportions, P1 hat minus P2 hat, from looking at the sample results. That, remember, is the critical value that goes right in the center of our confidence interval. Then, we computed out the standard error for the difference in sample proportions using the square root formula shown on the slide. We decide on the level of confidence we want to have. And based off of that, we determine a Z star value that we will want to use. We can do that with the help of stat key or other technology. We multiply our Z star value by our standard error value to find the margin of error. Margin of error is Z star times SE. And once we have margin of error, of course, we add and we subtract it from our statistic, from our P1 hat minus P2 hat, to get the lower and the upper limits of our confidence interval. That is the procedure for finding a confidence interval for difference in proportion. Let's turn our attention now to hypothesis testing. What if we'd like to do a hypothesis test involving differences in proportions? To assist with this, let's take a look at another example. Suppose that a city has just passed a special tax on the sale of carbonated beverages. And you are curious to know if the proportion of Democrats who support the tax, we'll call them that proportion P1, we're curious to know if that proportion is different than the proportion of Republicans, P2, who support the tax. If that is our question, if we want to know is there a difference in those two proportions, then our null hypothesis would be that P1 equals P2, that there's no difference. Our alternative hypothesis would be that P1 is not equal to P2, that it's different. Notice that that is a two-tailed test that we're gonna be carrying out. Now suppose your research into this carbonated beverage tax question yields the following results. Suppose that you take a random sample of N1 equal to 400 Democrats, and you find that 140 of them approve of the tax. In a random sample of N2 equal to 200 Republicans, you find that 60 of them approve of the tax. Those, of course, give us some sample proportions again. P1 hat, which is our proportion of Democrats approving of the tax, is 140 over 400, which works out to 
On the Republican side, from this population, 60 out of 200. So we have a sample proportion of P2 hat equal to 0 0.30. And so our difference in sample proportions is P1 hat minus P2 hat, and that's going to be 5%. Now that we have that difference in sample proportions, we know that always one of the key steps in conducting a hypothesis test is to find a test statistic, our z-score. Our very important equation is that z is equal to the statistic minus the null value divided by the standard error. We'll use that as we have so many times in the past. Now in this case, our statistic is our difference in the sample proportions, which we found to be 35% minus 30% or 5%. We'll use that for our statistic. Whenever we do any test involving a difference in proportions, the null value is zero, because if there's no difference, then there's a difference of zero. So that means our z-score is 0.05, minus the null value of zero divided by the standard error. So our z-score will be 0 0.05 divided by whatever the standard error for the difference in proportions is. Well, that's a question we still need to answer. What is the standard error for the difference in the proportions? Recall from earlier, that for scenarios where we have samples drawn from two independent populations, that we're gonna use the square root formula that you see on your screen for finding standard error. It's an expression that involves a square root of a sum of two fractions, where the first fraction comes from the first sample and the second fraction comes from the second sample. But it's important to remember here that we are not making a confidence interval we are doing a hypothesis test. And any time we do a hypothesis test, we begin with the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. And if the null hypothesis is true, that means that P1 equals P2. They're the same. However, while the null hypothesis tells us that they are the same, it doesn't tell us what that common proportion is. So the question is, what do we do for this common proportion that the two samples are now being assumed to share? Well, we're not going to do what we did when we formed a confidence interval. We're not going to use P1 hat and P2 hat to substitute in here. That wouldn't make any sense because that would then be saying that we thought that they were different, that the P1 and the P2 were different. But remember, again, we're assuming by the null hypothesis that they are the same value. So what we're going to do instead of using P1 hat and P2 hat, we're not gonna use that approach that we used when we found confidence intervals. Instead, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna create something called a pooled proportion p hat using the data from both of the samples. What we'll do is we will add together the number of yes results, x1 plus x2, from both of the samples and divide that by the sum of the sample size. In other words, we're going to put all of the people, all of the individuals from the two samples together and treat them as one big group. That's what the null hypothesis would say essentially we could do. And then we will use that pooled proportion, p hat, in our computation of the standard error. Let's take a look at how that plays out then in this particular scenario involving our beverage tax. What is our pooled proportion here? And what does that tell us about our SE and our Z score? Recall from earlier that we had 140 Democrats out of 400 who approved of the tax. And we had 60 out of the 200 Republicans 
who approved of the tax. But the null hypothesis says that P1 equals P2. In other words, we want to treat everything as if there is just one big group. We're going to forget about the Democrat label. We're going to forget about the Republican label. And we're just going to look at all of these individuals as part of one larger group. What does that tell us about our pooled proportion, our P hat? Well, since there were 140 Democrats who approved and 60 Republicans who approved, that's a total of 200 who approved altogether. Now, 200 out of how many? Well, there were 400 Democrats and 200 Republicans, so a total of 600 individuals altogether. So now we find by pooling the results from the two uh, separate samples, if we treat them as a single group, there would have been 200 approvals out of 600, or one third. A P hat or pooled proportion of one third here. And that is the value that we will use when calculating our standard error. Here's what we find. From substituting in a pooled proportion of one third for P hat in that formula, we'll have a square root that involves a sum of two fractions. The first fraction will be one third times two thirds divided by 400, since 400 was the first sample size. And the second fraction will be one third times two thirds divided by 200, since there were 200 in the second sample. Doing the calculations and working it out, we find that that square root comes out to be about 0 0.0408 for our standard error. And now that we have that standard error created here using the pooled proportion rather than separate P1 hat and P2 hat, we can now calculate our Z score. Remember from before, the Z score was going to be 0 0.05 divided by our standard error. But when we do that division now, we find out that 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.0408 gives us about 1.225. And what can we do with that z-score? We can use it to find a p-value, which will determine the outcome of our test. We proceed, now that we have our z-score of 1.225 in hand, we proceed to find our p-value. Recall we said before that this is a two-tailed hypothesis test. We're checking to see if there is a difference. If P1, not that P1 is greater than P2 or P1 is less than P2, but just that it's different. So that means that once we set our cutoff score to our Z score of 1.225, the p-value will be the combined area in the two tails beyond 1.225 and negative 1.225. Stat key shows us that the area to the right of 1.225 is about 0.11. So doubling that, we now find our p-value. Our p-value will be two times one, two times 0.11, or 0.22. Ah. So then, what conclusion now can we draw from that resulting p value of 0.22? We know that that p value is far too large to be significant. It is certainly larger than any of the usual levels of significance 5%, 1%. It's even larger than 10%. Those are the levels that we customarily test at. So because the p-value is bigger than any reasonable significance level, our result is not significant. And that means that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We are not finding evidence for a difference in the proportions of Democrats versus Republicans who support the tax. And that is a overview of how we conduct hypothesis tests involving differences in proportions. Thank you for listening.
invite you to stay tuned to our next video dealing with the difference in sample means. In our next video, we'll be taking a look at the idea of doing hypothesis tests and confidence intervals when we're working with sample means.